as Ryan said, my name is Jeff. I'm also one of the pastors here, and it is my privilege to bring you through Nehemiah chapter 9. So if you have a Bible, open that thing up. If you need to get a device fired up, Nehemiah 9. I'll set some context while you guys are getting there. Um, obviously, getting to this point in Nehemiah where we've seen some things take place. So it's important to realize where we've been so we understand where we are going. And so really at the beginning, we see Nehemiah, this character who gets called by God to go to Jerusalem and to rebuild a broken down city and its walls. He responds to this call. As he responds to this call, he's seeing God's favor, provision, God continuing to pave the path so that he could accomplish the task. And then we begin to see the walls being built. As the walls are being built, we talked about how you see this opposition coming against him. Uh, that always when we want to try to do something that God has called us to, the enemy doesn't take too kindly to that. And so he opposes that work. We see that taking place. Now the walls at this point in chapter 9 are built. They see this physical walls have taken place. Everything's built. It's looking cool. The problem is, is that Nehemiah understands that there needs to be some rebuilding of spiritual walls as well. I saw even in the beginning of chapter 8 this kind of turn towards let's get back into God's word and they read God's word publicly. And we see in chapter 9 is actually the longest recorded prayer in the Bible in Nehemiah chapter 9. So we're going to kind of launch into it in just a moment. But to kind of get your minds going in the direction that I want them to go, let me just tell you the title of the message is called Acknowledge. Acknowledge. And there's often times in our life where we just need to acknowledge the truth. Amen? And, you know, I was reminded of that. Um, You know, I was in Mexico. I did survive the hurricane. Uh, No really damage or anything our way. So uh, we were lucky there. But there is some that were a little south of us that did get uh, some of the hurricane and got some flooding and those kinds of things. So if you can remember to keep them in your prayers, uh, there's recovery efforts going on there. But as we went there to do some ministry, we went to this church, uh, kind of a cool story, I'll make it brief, but uh, a church that was planted that our church now supports uh, in Mazatlan, Mexico, and the pastor of this church is someone I met when he was 13 years old in an orphanage down in a town called Maniadero, which is just outside of Ensenada. Uh, he's obviously now been called by the Lord to begin a church, and we felt called to, to come alongside of him. Not just financially, but uh, we want to be able to go there with teams and to be able to, to also offer our assistance, and we did that on this trip. I was able to go with Pastor James and Kenny, who was up here, and another man named Joe. Went down and did a bunch of construction projects, a bunch of electrical work that was awesome. Uh, and we also did some teaching things. Uh, Friday night, we did the youth group. Uh, Pastor James led the youth group, and uh, Saturday, we did a men's conference. It was an amazing men's conference. God really moved. Uh, did the the Saturday or did the Sunday uh, services for them, um, and then on Monday I was actually scheduled to do another teaching of church planning, and then on Tuesday to do one of their local fellowships that just opened up. Uh, the hurricane had other plans, so Monday and Tuesday got canceled. Uh, but back to the story, I want you to understand with me the word acknowledge. On Friday, you know, we had kind of got there and settled in and talked to the pastor, got a game plan together, and Friday was really the day we were going to spend half the day doing construction, and the other half we are going to do youth group. So we do youth group, and, you know, it's Mexico. And around a lot of the world, how many of you guys are aware that soccer is a big deal, right? Uh, And soccer is a big deal there. And so they have this kind of back area that they've set up a a, a kind of a miniature size uh, soccer court or soccer field. Uh, It's all cement, uh, but it's done really nice. And so what they usually do is for about an hour and a half before youth group, uh, a lot of the local kids even come that uh, usually don't attend the church, but they are attracted by the, obviously, soccer game, and then they come and they listen to the study. So we get in there and we mix it up. And, you know, we're going, and you got to know this about me. Um, I don't know if you've ever met a more competitive person. Uh, It it might even be a sin at times, i got to confess. Uh, I'm very competitive. And so, you know, we're mixing it up with all these, you know, teenagers. And obviously, th- these kids have probably been playing soccer since they were, like, could kick a ball, right? Um, and so we get there and we mix it up. And I had to acknowledge, especially the next day, that I'm not young anymore, people. <laughs> Anybody else ever experienced this? You kind of get in the moment and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I didn't even know. 
I had a muscle right there. How does that hurt right now? And the back sore and everything. Sometimes we need to acknowledge the reality of our life and the truth. And that truth hit me like a ton of bricks for the next couple of days. But I want to get into the message today because I think that really summarizes the main thought. And that is, is that the people of Israel are now challenged to acknowledge some truths that they had been neglecting. So I want to start out in verse 1 and we'll expound from there. But it starts out, Now on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Uh, Just so you guys understand, these were forms of worship or repentance or humbling themselves. Uh, I think most of us understand the fasting component, right? Uh, An opportunity for us to, to focus on God and not the physical food, but to be nourished by God's spirit. And that's kind of what they're doing here. They're doing these outward actions. Not only that, most of us have never put sackcloth and put ashes on our head, uh, but that's what they're doing. They're putting the dirt on their head and they're putting these sackcloth outfits on, again, as a way to express themselves to God, as a way to be able to say, God, we want to be able to repent for the things that we've done wrong. We're in mourning, literally putting this dust on their heads, a way of humbling themselves before God and saying, God, we need to get right with you. Continues on in verse two. Then those of Israel's lineage separated themselves from all foreigners. And they stood and confessed their sins and their iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God for one-fourth of the day. And for the other fourth, they confessed and worshiped the Lord, their God. Now, what I want to be able to focus in on this morning is really three main thoughts that I see in here. And this is, again, a, a, a picture of these people coming, being led. Many people believe even the reading of this scripture would either have been done by the Levite priests who may have come up and take turns just reading the word of God so that this truth is permeating in the air, or maybe even Ezra himself. But what's interesting, for a fourth of the day, people, uh, if my math is right, that's like, what, six hours or something? That's a long time. How many of us, honestly, would be sitting through that and going, oh my gosh, can they make a point for God's sakes? But this is where they were at. They're like, God, we need to hear from you. We need the truth of your word. And they're sitting there listening. And then they begin to worship the Lord. They begin to outwardly express what's going on. I want to start by defining the word acknowledge to you as we move forward in this message. The word acknowledge defined, first of all, it is a verb. It means to admit the truth, existence or reality of something. Key point to show you have received something. They gave us an example there. It says, with a wave of his hand, the king acknowledged the cheering crowd. Now get this picture in your mind because it's different than, so you've got this king who's in this parade. And so obviously there's a crowd and he looks out and he's like, okay, there's a crowd. But he does more than that, doesn't he? It says to acknowledge, he actually sees the crowd and waves his hand to acknowledge that he sees them. This is what's key in the message today is to realize that God wants more from us than to just think about the things that we've done wrong. To say, well, yeah, that's true, but to act upon it, you see. In this illustration, you see the king saying, okay, I I see you guys over there. Acknowledging, doing something outwardly to express what the truth really is, that he has understood the truth, that there's a crowd there, and now he wants to acknowledge them. That's exactly what's going on here, isn't it? I mean, why are these people putting on these goofy sackcloth and throwing dust on their head? Uh, There's a reason. Because they want to acknowledge where they're at with God. Not just think about it, but to be able to express themselves. Isn't that what worship is all about? I mean, have you guys ever really thought through why do we come in as church people and sing Kumbaya four or five times? It's a way to express physically what's going on in our heart, isn't it? Some of you maybe have been curious, why do people seem like they raise their hand? Or, or sometimes you see people kneeling down. That's a physical expression that they're making to God to be able to worship Him. 
There's nothing goofy about it. That's the way some people are feeling led. God, I want to just acknowledge you today. I, I, I feel your presence in this place. I want to get right with you today in the house of God. They're truly acknowledging God. And you see, that's what's going on here. And here's the three truths I want to park on today because they are critical, not just to this chapter, but to our everyday life and to life itself. You see, they're declaring who God is. But here's the thought. A lot of us, maybe in our mind, would say the right things. Oh yeah, God is this or God is that. But I wonder if we're expressing that with the way we're living. I wonder if that's really where we're at today in our relationship with the truth of who God is. You see, they're declaring some truths here and there's many truths about God. But God is holy and perfect. He is above all things. He is the creator of the universe. Not only that, he's the one who died so that we might have life. He is our heavenly father. Are these thoughts truly in your heart and in your mind this morning? Or maybe you're on a journey much like I was on early in my life. I looked at God way differently. I looked at God as a young person as more of a kill joy in the sky than the real joy that he really is. You see, you can look at him and it's almost like a, another authority figure. He's someone who's just trying to control your life. And hey, I've already got enough rules. And I mean, there's a lot of good things that seem like I, I look around and my friends are experiencing. And if I become a Christian and get way into this God thing, I, I think I can't do all of those things. I, I, I don't want that. I, I, I want what I want. And so we bring God to this place where he's below those things instead of above all things. Do we trust that God has our best interest in mind? Do we trust that we were created in the image of Almighty God because He desires a great life for us? You know, one of the things that I discovered in that scripture that we were created in the image of God found in Genesis is this. Why were we created in the image of God? Many layers to that, but I think one of the most interesting to me is we were created in his image so he could have a personal relationship with us. You see, the, the animals of the earth are not created in the image of God. They were a creation of God. The, the fish of the sea, uh, creations of God, but not created in his image. He can't have that personal connection and relationship with any other created being other than human beings. That's the God that we serve that cares so much about each and every one of us that he wants to hang out with us, man. That's crazy to me. The God of all the universe wants your company, wants a personal, intimate relationship with you. Where does God sit in the truth of your heart this morning? Have you realized that God is truly faithful, that he will never break a promise that he does not lie, that he is perfect and holy and just. All of those things, that describes the real God. And here's why it's so important. Because when we put God where he belongs, everything else falls into place, doesn't it? When we don't put God where he belongs, everything else can kind of shake us to the core. You see, when you understand that God is above all things, that difficult trial is still underneath the power of God and you can put it in its proper place and say, my God's got this. When you're facing that difficult time and you understand that God's here and that difficult time is here, that addiction is here, that struggle is here, you understand that God can take care of it. We need to put God in the right place and quit trying to put him in our mind or bring him down to our level. He is not us. He is God himself. Amen. And you see, that's what Israel is understanding here. They're like, hey, God, we've got to proclaim who you are. Man, we've got to praise you this morning. We've got to be able to say, God, you are the creator. You're the maker. You sustain all things. You've got this under control. But it brings us to our second truth. And I got to tell you, the second truth is more humbling than it is exciting to talk about who God is because the second truth is the truth about man. The truth about man. You see, they begin to recite some of the stories from their history and it tells us this in verse 16 and following. 
He says, but they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened or stiffened their necks, and they did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you had done among them. But they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a leader to return to their bondage. You see, story after story is recited in this prayer of the rebellion of the people. But how many of you know this isn't just a story about the Israelite people at this time? This is a story about mankind itself, isn't it? We are rebellious by nature. We are sinful by nature. And I know sometimes people want to push back on that and say, well, no, man is basically good, pastor. Um, I don't know. Maybe you ought to come over to my house for a while because man ain't basically good. Man is basically bad, but because of the grace of Jesus Christ, we can get some good in us, amen? I mean, we need to understand the truth about mankind. Mankind is sinful by nature. We've all heard pastors get up and tell us, hey, think about your little kids. Even when they're little, they're lying. They're fighting over toys. They're doing all these things. That wasn't something that was learned behavior. That's something that's inherent behavior. We understand that, and that's where we're at. And yet, when we don't admit our sinfulness as human beings, we're caught in it instead of released from it, you see. God has come to give us freedom, to release us from these things. That's why Jesus said, I have come to set the captives free. It actually says, it's in Isaiah, that Jesus, now quoting this from Isaiah in his early ministry, said, I have been anointed to preach the Gospels and to set the captives free. That's what he's talking about. We're all in bondage. And what's interesting, when we look at this picture, what's going on? Israel's in bondage. They're in captivity. It's a picture of what sin can do to all of us. But yet, often, we want to neglect the truth that man is sinful and needs a Savior. Oh, well, I've met some pretty good people, Pastor. I have too. I know a lot of good people, but they're still sinners by nature, and they still need a Savior. I like to consider myself a pretty good person. But you know what? I definitely need a Savior because I've made mistakes. I understand inside of me is something that is not of God until Jesus came to cleanse me from that unrighteousness. The thoughts and the desires I had were not from God. They were from me. That is our human nature. And and not only in this initial step, I want to make sure I make this clear. Because we all need Jesus Christ to come and to set us free and to be our Savior and our Lord. But you see, he's talking to people here who probably had a relationship with God already. Uh, they're already at this place where they've been crying out. Yeah, they probably stubbed their toes. Their forefathers had messed up. They'd done some things wrong. But what he states here is over and over and over again in the nation of Israel, God did a radical miracle. He says, hey, you parted the Red Seas. (coughs) You, You took us out of this wilderness. Even when we needed food, you rained down bread from heaven. How crazy is that, people? I mean, we look at these things almost just like they're stories. That's insane. That is amazing things that God has done in their past. And yet it says their forefathers rebelled against God. I mean, a lot of us would like to think, man, if I saw the the parting of the Red Seas, Pastor, I'd never even trouble again. I'd never sin. I mean, I'd follow God so closely, he would barely even know I was there. Liars. <laughs> Liars. We understand because many of us have experienced miracles of God, right? I mean, we've seen things, even our own salvation was a complete miracle. And yet, how many would say there was a time, maybe even currently, that you've struggled a little bit in your relationship with God? That maybe you've gotten sidetracked. Maybe you've lost focus. That's what's going on here in this nation. These weren't horrible people and we're amazing people. These were people and we're people. These same tendencies can happen to all of us. Why? That's the truth about man. We are sinful by nature. 
And even as we get saved and we go to the altar and we ask God to save us from our sins, how many of you would agree you still deal with sin, amen? I mean, it's not something that just goes away. Wouldn't it be amazing if I could say, hey, if you need salvation, come to the altar. You came to the altar. I said a prayer over you. You left and you're like, oh, my life is perfect from here on out. Don't even have to worry. I don't even have a temptation anymore, pastor, after that prayer. That's just not the truth, is it? That's not the reality of our lives. We still have to deal with these things, and that's what these people are dealing with, the truth about man. Last but not least, I want to focus on the third truth, and that is the truth about sin. (coughs) The truth about sin. What I see in this truth is God helping these people and us to understand the result of sin. Because again, a lot of times we dismiss the fact of where sin will take us. You see, it tells them here that we are in great distress, they cry out to the Lord in verse 37 and 38. Because of all of this, we have broken this covenant. Remember, they are in exile or bondage to another nation. And so what they're kind of putting together is, hey, this was our doing. This wasn't because God didn't like us. This is because we allowed sin to take us in this direction. And wow, here we are. Do you understand the truth about sin and the heart of God? God is not trying to take things away from us and prevent us from having a good time. It's just the opposite. He's trying to keep us safe like a loving heavenly father would do. Just like us as parents would not want to see our children put in a dangerous position where harm could come to them, where they could be destroyed. We would try to prevent and give them instruction to lead them away from those things. And yet sometimes in our mind, we're just like, sin is, it's kind of fun, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of like a a cute little stuffed animal from time to time. I like to carry it around. Well, that cute little stuffed animal is going to turn into something that is going to destroy you there is a thief who has come to steal kill and to destroy jesus christ said Uh, he didn't really mince words there did he he's like i'm just going to give it to you straight here's what sin will do in your life not only the ultimate destruction when you're separated from god because you haven't received the forgiveness of sins but even on this journey of life you will see over and over the destruction of relationships You will begin to see the pain of this life without a Savior who can offer you hope. God wants us to understand the truth about sin. And sometimes it's not an easy subject to bring up. We just want to talk about things like the love of God and how amazing grace is and all of those things which are absolutely true. But grace isn't amazing until you understand what we've been saved from. I mean, how can we be thankful to God when we don't really put it in context where we were, who he is, and now what we have in Jesus Christ? That's good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ saved us from this eternal destination, from the damage of sin in our life. He has set us free. Who the Son sets free will be free indeed. Are you experiencing the freedom of Jesus Christ? It tells us in the book of Hebrews that there is sin that literally weighs us down. Lay aside every sin that entangles or weighs you down. Have we done those things? Are we carrying those around like, hey, this is kind of cool. I mean, I want to have my cake and eat it too. I mean, I I got my salvation. And and God's like, "It's, it's not even about that. It's not about what you can get away with and it's okay, am I still going to be saved? Is it okay if I do X, Y, and Z? Do I still have salvation? God's like, it's not even what it's about. It's about I love you too much to see you hurt and destroy yourself. I don't want to see your family damaged. I love you too much, son. I love you too much, daughter. I'm going to tell you these things. It's out of the heart of a loving father. And we must see sin the way that God sees sin. The psalmist in Psalm 32 and verse 5 says this, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. 
you see the acknowledgement, and this is where we are challenged today, is to ask ourselves, are we willing to truly do business with God this morning? Are you willing to acknowledge who you are, the mistakes that you have made, the things that you are currently struggling with in relation to who God really is and say, God, I, I, I need to put these things down. God, I, I need your help to rid these things from my life. God, I want to connect with you today and I can only do it when I own up and acknowledge these things that I'm struggling with. God is simply just asking us to acknowledge it. He's not even asking us to do any of the work. And yet sometimes we want to dig our heels in. God is a good God. He wants to bring healing to our life. All he asks is that we would acknowledge that truth. You know, I think about sin and its effect, and it reminds me of a story I read years ago. And it was about an army sergeant who was in boot camp training young men and young women to be members of the army. The base was in Florida somewhere. And the story goes this way, that during those obstacle course runs, towards the end was this rope that they would swing across in a big pond in the middle that they had to clear. What he had noticed is over and over, many of these young men and young women were intentionally only going halfway. Why? Uh, Florida's kind of hot, if you don't know. They're in an obstacle course, and they're thinking, hey, it's going to be kind of refreshing to drop in this water, and I can kind of crawl out. At least I got my refreshment, and now I can end my race. You see, what he decided to do was very wise. He put an alligator in the middle of that pond. <laughs> so as he put this alligator in the middle of this pond, interestingly enough, they were all clearing the pond now. Here's the truth spiritually behind that story. Many of us do the same thing when it comes to sin in the world. We think it's going to be refreshing. And God says, no, it's like that alligator who's going to destroy you. You need to, to stick with me to the other side. You need to allow me to give you the strength to get to the other side of that pond and not just jump in because you think, oh, this will be refreshing. I've had a really rough week. This is something maybe that I want to experience in this life. It looks like fun. It looks like it'll bring me some relief. And God's like, it's not going to bring you relief. It's going to bring you destruction. And I am a loving God who is going to tell you the truth, even if it hurts. Sometimes we need a pat on the back from the Lord, don't we? We need to be encouraged. Hey, God loves us. But sometimes we need a kick in the rear end, don't we? And you see, what took place in this story is that Nehemiah and Ezra went before the crowd and said, guys, it's time we take that kick in the rear end seriously. It's time for us to get down on our hands and knees in sackcloth and putting dust on our head, fasting, don't eat, because we need to repent before the Lord. I close with this thought about repentance. You know, repentance is one of those words sometimes and our church culture that people avoid because it sounds too rough and abrasive. It's just a misunderstanding of what the word really means. The word repentance simply means to turn directions, right? Literally, it talks about the change of direction in the mind which leads to a change of behavior in the life. But this is a definition I found years ago that I hold on to because I love the imagery and the picture of it. I mean, most of us understand that the, the top of a condominium complex or a hotel is called the penthouse suite, right? I mean, that, that's like the best place, a place many of us will probably never visit. <laughs> but we've heard about them, right? And, and so you get this picture of the highest place in a condominium, this best place is called the penthouse. And the word re in front of it talks about returning. It literally defined that way means to return to the highest place. God just wants us to return to the highest place. He's like, I I'm here for you. This, this is as good as it gets. I have all of the answers. I have all of the strength that you will need. I'm just asking you to return to me. The question this morning we must ask ourselves personally is are we willing to repent before the Lord? Are we willing to acknowledge him this day for who he is, 
for who we are and for the damage that sin will do in our life, God is just simply asking us to acknowledge it. And you know, in our American culture, we seem to want to come to church. And I know nobody says, why well, I've just come to put a check mark in the box. I know it's deeper than that for you guys. But would you do real business with God this morning? So we can look back on this occasion and say, you know, there was a time that I needed to come before the Lord and just make confession. Where I needed to come before the Lord and say, God, I, I need to acknowledge the fact that, that I, I'm not right with you right now. I've got things that are getting in our way in the relationship you died for us to experience. God is simply calling us to acknowledge it. 